for the second session of allergy webinar. Today, earlier we have discussed about the diagnostics, the various diagnostic of the allergic diseases. And today we are going to discuss even more important, what is the role of immunotherapy in various allergic diseases, which includes an array of things, starting from allergic rhinitis, bronchial asthma, urticaria, food allergies, or various other things. Today we have a very, uh, we have a mixed faculty here. We have young dynamic uh, pulmonologist and we have a very experienced allergy specialist from USA, Dr. PKV. Sir is a graduate from Mysore Medical College, India, and he's been working as a clinical professor at University of Colorado. Sir is also the chairman of Global Chest Initiative and International Asthma Services as USA. Sir has been uh, running lots of programs in India at various centers, which includes one of us at CMC. And Sir is a lead editor for textbook of allergy for the clinician, uh, uh, which is the second edition is in press. Uh, we welcome you, Sir, on this webinar. And um, uh, we always get lots of learning from you. Our second speak panelist for today is uh, Dr. Pradeep Narayana, who is founder chairman trustee of Chest Council of India. He's working as a junior medical consultant, respiratory medicine at District TB Center, Kasar Gore, Government of Kerala. A third speaker for a uh, third panelist for tonight is Dr. Ravi Dosi, who is a graduate from MGM College with an uh, best by bagging Dr. SM Award for Best PG, as well as he was a university topper. Currently, he is working as a consultant pulmonologist at Kokila Ben Dirubani Ambani Hospital in Dor. And formerly, he has been associated with the Department of Respiratory Diseases Science as a professor in HOD. Uh, he is renowned for adopting simple methods to and practical approach towards handling problems. Next. Uh, panelist for today is Dr. Aditya Chavla, who is a con consultant interventional pulmonologist working in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Critical Care and Sleep Disorders at Saroj Super Speciality Hospital and Jaipur Golden Hospital, New Delhi. Aditya is uh, a member of various national and international societies. He has particular interest in uh, interventional pulmonology, including cryocanalization, cryobiopsies, EBERS, placement of stents, medical thoracoscopy, um, balloon dilatation, endobronchial glue placement in cases of hemoptysis. And our last panelist for tonight is Dr. Kumar Utsa, a consultant pulmonologist and critical care specialist at Chest Clinic Durgapun from Varanasi. He is also a director of the pulmonology division at Agreem Hospital. He finished his um, PG from BJ Medical College, Ahmedabad. He has vast experience in working with COVID patients in Baranasi, has done quite a bit of research in MGR and XGR TB, and has achieved a National Young Scientist Award for presenting the largest study on XGR TB patients in NAPCON 2014, as well as in ERS. Uh, he has numerous article publications and a textbook to his credit. He has been a faculty panelist and in a speaker at various national and international conferences. So I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. PKV, as well as all our panelists for tonight. Uh, I hand over uh, it to Dr. PKV, who is going to tell us about the basics of the immunotherapy, and that will set a stage for our further discussion. Over to you, sir. Okay. Good evening to you all. And Dr. Richa, thank you so much for your kind introduction. And I appreciate you telling all the, the audience about all the other different panelists, that uh, distinguished panelists that are here with us today. And uh, <clears throat> I'm honored to be in your group. This is called Chest Council of India, right? Is that, if I'm saying right, Chest Council of India. That's right, sir. Mm -hmm. So the topic that has been uh, assigned to me today is actually a very important topic. At the same time, it is a hot topic. You know, it is a hot topic, not only for allergy specialists, for also related specialists. The related specialists would include pulmonologists, ENT, and 
to some extent dermatologist to <clears throat> so what i am going to do in the next 20 minutes is give you an overview of this subject give you an overview basically talk about the nuts and bolts of allergen immunotherapy so i'm going to share the screen now let us see if i can get that here one second i'm going to go through some basics really fast because uh, we have covered this in the previous uh, presentation so the first let's talk about some basics what is allergy allergy is an exaggerated immunological reaction against substances that are generally harmless to most of us it's an exaggerated look, uh, re immunological reaction so where is the defect in allergy disorder the defect is not in the eosinophil it is not the ige it is not the mast cell it is a t lymphocyte it is a t cell disorder what works on t cell any medications that we are using works on the t cell does steroids work on t cell does antihistamines work on t cell antileukotrienes do this work on t cell answer is no none of the pharmacotherapeutic therapeutic agents that we use and none of the pharmacological agents that we use works on the t cell so what works on the t cell is only one modality of treatment is allergen immunotherapy allergen immunotherapy is the only modality that acts on the t cell it is the only modality that can change the natural course of the disease what is the natural course of the allergic disease is progression allergic disease is a progressive immunological disorder when i say progressive means it keeps on getting worse it keeps on getting more severe and more involved uh, other organs are involved you know it moves from the nose to upper airway to the lower airway then it can also manifest it in the severity of the problem more uh, airway remodeling happens so all these and also the patient gets sensitized to more and more things it is called neo sensitization they develop newer sensitivities existing sensitivities get worse and these are all what we call as an immunological progression then clinical progression is symptoms getting worse symptoms last longer symptoms getting less responsive to medications symptoms spreading to other tissue organs this is called clinical progression all those things are not touched by any pharmacotherapy you can give any type of pharmacotherapy like inhaled steroids and all that it is not going to stop the progression so allergen immunotherapy is the only modality that can halt it can slow down sometimes even reverse the progression so it's a very powerful way of treating the problem somehow my slide doesn't get get you know sometimes it gives me trouble doesn't move <laughs> sorry one second okay now this is a basic allergic mechanism to keep it very brief on the left hand side you see there are two steps sensitization second right hand side is a re-exposure and the most important cell here is a T lymphocyte, which is in the lymph node. All these things occur in the lymph node. So the first exposure of the antigen is entering through the compromised epithelium and the antigen presenting cell picks it up, presenting to the T cell, which directs the B cell to produce the IgE antibodies, which goes and gets hooked on to the surface of the mast cell, as well as floats in the serum class 3 IgE. And when the re-exposure happens, the antigen is picked up by these uh, IgE molecules that are sticking on the surface of the mast cell, degranulation happens, histamine release happens, strip, and several other uh, mediators are released, and you get the allergic inflammation. So when we are giving medications like steroids, antihistamines and all that, it works in, it working at the tissue level. And there are certain medications like chromaline, ketotaphine that stabilizes the mast cell membrane. 
remove they it, it cuts slows down or cuts, cuts down the degranulation but nothing works on the t cell except immunotherapy so immunotherapy is a way of modulating the impatience immune response it targets the t lymphocytes and facilitates the formation of what we call as t reg cells we used to call it before t suppressor cells before now they are called t reg cells t reg cells are very important cells in that they are all suppressor cells all reg cells are the suppressor cells it suppresses the whole immune response so if you look at this uh, diagram it is just telling you that allergic immunotherapy starts working from day one from day one it works but can we appreciate it clinically no we cannot appreciate it but immunologically it has been shown that it is like any other medications if you give an antibiotic it starts working in a few hours so if you are giving the allergen immunotherapy it should do something it can't just be doing nothing when you give uh, particularly certain uh, powerful medications like allergen immunotherapy antigens in your system you are giving it systemically we are talking about subcutaneous immunotherapy or even something well it goes into your system it has to do something what it does is it slows down uh, the local desensitization that is it causes local desensitization it reduces the release of histamine and mediators from the mast cells and basophis that is the first thing that happens the first thing that happens is reduction in the release of the mediators it is called local desensitization that is the first thing that happens gradually as you continue the other things keep on happening would be increasing in the IgG production, reduction in the IgE production, as well as the, the mediators that are released will be like interleukin instead of IL-4 and IL-13 which are pro-inflammatory, you will get IL-10 which actually reduces the uh, epithelial swelling, mucus production. So all these things will happen over a period of time. So the TH2 cell, what it is does in an allergic individual is it promotes IgE production through IL-4 and IL-13. It promotes endothelial proliferation and swelling of the mucous membrane as well as remodeling through again IL-4 and IL-13. And it also causes, it uh, sort of recruits these eosinophils, basophils, mast cells and all that through IL-3, IL-4, IL-5, IL-9, all these interleukins, that is what the TH2 cell does. What does the T-Rex cell do after we start the immunotherapy is it will produce IL-10 and TGF-beta. Uh, and TGF-beta and IL-10 will suppress the IgE production, it will suppress the uh, the homing of the T cell that means it will reduce the number of uh, the TH2 cells. It will also suppress the granulation. Uh, the it will actually reduce the release of uh, mediators like histamine and uh, other mediators at the mast cell level or the basophil level. That is, it promotes local desensitization. All these things happen as you are continuing the immunotherapy. <clears throat> So these are all the immunological changes that happens. But what do you actually see when you are giving immunotherapy in a patient? You may not see a whole lot initially, but we see some changes. Our patient actually starts feeling certain things within six months. They start feeling that their sensitization or their symptoms are getting a little bit better. Because what is happening is local desensitization is low, the IgE level is getting low and also there is an increased production of IgA locally and these people get better as time goes on and with immunotherapy majority of the patients seem to get relief within one year. I am talking about subcutaneous immunotherapy. In two years there is a significant improvement. In three years of immunotherapy the improvement is so significant that you are able to reduce the pharmacotherapy you are we in our practices we are able to reduce even inhaled steroids both intranasal as well as inhaled steroids for asthma uh, in about 50 to 60 percent of patients 
Now, is that true for all asthmatics? Not really. It is only for allergic asthma, TH2 driven asthma. That is where the immunotherapy works. Immunotherapy doesn't work for the whole, all, all different types of phenotypes of asthma. It only works for allergic asthma. So, immunotherapy is a very powerful way of treating allergic uh, conditions. So, summary is it's a powerful immunomodulator. It changes the milieu from TH2 to TH1. It is the only disease modifying therapy and the target cell is a T lymphocyte. So what, how does uh, immunotherapy has had a bad repute in the past? The reason was the selection of patients, selection of antigens and the knowledge of prescribing or writing up the, the prescription was poor. So there was poor selection of patients. So pa patients were treated, uh, patients were treated just based upon skin test only. So we were treating skin tests, not the patients. So that is poor selection. You need to treat only clinically relevant antigens. That is clinically relevant skin tests, clinically relevant immunocap results. And that is what a proper selection of patients and antigens is. So how do we do that? So the three most important factors in patient selection is to history, history, history. That is, you have to take a good history. Once you take a good history and you then you do the skin testing or the immunocap, then you take a second history after that. That is what we call as a summary conference where we try to correlate. We go into more specific with the patient and get to see whether we can correlate between the history as well as the skin test results and that correlation is very important. That is where you weed out the non-clinically uh, relevant and you know non-clinical uh, or clinically less relevant antigens. So these skin tests will show many reactions. Not all reactions are clinically relevant. So you need to pick out the clinically relevant and that needs practice. You can't learn it with one lecture like this. It may take you several years to really master it but generally it takes to about seeing and about a couple of hundreds of patients and you can sort of get a pretty good feeling how to do that correlation. So when does allergy immunotherapy work is only when you have proper patient selection, proper antigen selection, right at the proper composition and you properly administer the uh, injections or the drops. These are the four things has to be done. When it doesn't work is when you have poor patient selection, wrong antigen selection, poor quality of antigens. Let me spend two minutes on the quality of the antigens. We at uh, CMC Vellore well did a bioassay of the indigenous dust mite antigen that is available through the companies in India. So we picked around three of those company antigens and compared with the standardized antigen, potent antigen from the United States. And what the results showed were the indigenous antigen potency was only between, was seven to 26%. That is all of the potency of the standardized antigen. That means it was 93% 76% to 93% less potent than a standardized antigen from the US. That is very disturbing, which means you have done everything right. You have taken a good history, you have done the proper skin test, uh, you have done the homework, but you are using the wrong antigen for testing and treatment. There's no good. So it's very, very important to make sure you have good quality antigens before you test or uh, treat these patients. Where do you get these good quality antigens? Sometimes you have to buy it by imported antigens have to be bought. And the three most important antigens in India are dust mite, cockroach, alternaria. If you get those three antigens, good quality, you are covering most of the allergens because most of the pollens that are produced, pollen antigens that are produced by the Indian indigenous companies are pretty good. But dust mite, seems to be of less poorer quality and that is something that we need to be aware of. Now, who do you treat with allergic, allergy immunotherapy? Usually, we would like to treat a young patient 
the, I told you about progression. So you catch the disease young. So a young patient with a young disease or an early milder disease and a compliant patient. So these three qualities are very important for the success of allergen immunotherapy. When I say young patient, how young you might ask? It could be as young as five year old. And even people, there are instances they have started allergen immunotherapy at three year old. So the younger the patient, the younger the disease, better the response. So the young age for us, it can go up to around 25, 30, even 20, 25, 30 is still young for us with allergic disease. You can still do a very good job, but you can't do a good job with allergen immunotherapy when the disease has lasted for 30, 40 years, say like a 60 year old person coming with uh, comorbidities, he has got both asthma, COPD. These are not good candidates for allergen immunotherapy. So persons that you do not want to treat with allergen immunotherapy are people with severe long-term disease, with people with comorbid conditions, people with non-allergic disease and non-compliant patients. So a clinical scenario, a short one is a 25 year old male, seasonal allergy, seasonal asthma, history of definite progression, definite skin test positive, good correlation. He, this is a good candidate. Good candidate because he's a young patient, early disease, progressive disease, significant sensitization, a 60 year old smoker, diagnosis asthma COPD, still has some positive reactions on the skin. He's not again good candidate for allergen immunotherapy because the correlation is not good. You don't want to treat skin test, you want to treat the patient. So here, this is a very long-term disease and there is a lot of irreversible changes that have happened, poor correlationship of skin testing and reactivity uh, and with skin test and the history and this is not a good candidate. And we also have to appreciate that progression is a very, very important property of allergic disease and these are the subtle points with progression. When a child is not responding to the medication, when the child symptoms are still persistent in spite of medications, or child is developing newer symptoms, or it is taking longer for the medications to work, these are subtle signs. These signs of uh, progression is not in any guidelines. There is no test for it. The only way you can find out whether the disease is progressing is getting a good history. So that is why it is very important for us to spend more time with the patients when they come to see you. And these are subtle things that you are going to catch. When you ask the mother, how is your child doing? Mother, mother says, you know, not bad, you know, but the medication is not working as good as before. You know, that is enough. That is a subtle thing. You cannot find anything on skin uh, by, by, by physical exam at that time. And you can also get an idea about immunological progression by repeating skin test. You can do a few repeat skin tests in six months, say every six months, and you will see the existing reactions getting bigger or newer sensitivity coming on. That is called neosensitization. This is immunological progression. So both clinical progression, immunological progressions are indicators of progressive allergic disease. And that is an indication that you probably have to think about allergen immunotherapy. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is it is subtle. It can be easily be missed. Unless you look for it, you will not get it. And in our uh, clinic, it's a tertiary center in Mysore. And this slide is summary is 75% of patients in a matter of 18 months developed asthma from allergic rhinitis. They did not have asthma when they came to our clinic. They had allergic rhinitis and it progressed to asthma within 18 months. So it is progression can occur very, very fast. So very important for us. The dictum is treat clinically relevant antigen, treat the patient, do not just treat skin test. So I am going to stop somewhere here because of the question of time and we can answer further questions as it comes. If I want to use the slides again to clarify certain things, I hope you will allow me to do so. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to tell certain basic facts about allergen immunotherapy. Can I stop the share, Dr. Richa?
Sure, sir. Okay. Um, thank you so much, sir, for giving us such a wonderful, as always, an insight mm -hmm. into what immunotherapy is really, and also asserting the fact that, you know, uh, immunotherapy can really work because, as you said, there are lots of myths associated for how long and once we stop, it comes back again and lots of things. So to burst down the mist, uh, the various myths associated with the treatment in particular of immunotherapy for the allergic disease. Let's uh, discuss certain common questions and we would also like to take up the questions from the audience. So Dr. Ravi, can I ask you, what are the various types of immunotherapies and among those which you consider is the best? Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir, for an excellent uh, discourse on immunotherapy. And uh, I like sir told, it's all based on the strictly on history and how we elicit the allergy pattern of that particular patient. But aller allergen immunotherapy can basically be given either sublingually or subcutaneously. That is the route of administration or even the site of administration can vary. It can be bronchial, oral or nasal or uh, we, the, the temporal way, how we give it, it can be a rush immunotherapy, it can be cluster immunotherapy. So depending on how we choose to treat the allergy and what is the severity of exposure, I think we might decide on how to go ahead with the immunotherapy types. Right. So uh, there is no per se that oral is better or subcutaneous is better or nasal, uh, not really. It depends on the choice, the availability and the probable uh, I think the preference of the patient, I would say, and the expertise of the allergist who is giving and their experience. Is that right, sir? Can I make a comment? Yes, sir, please. We have uh, the literature is rich with a lot of information of subcutaneous immunotherapy, which has been in work for 100 years. Right. Even before the advent of uh, IgE, we were doing subcutaneous immunotherapy. But sublingual immunotherapy has been there for, for the last maybe two decades at the most. Now, if you compare those two, which works better? Subcutaneous definitely works better. It works 50% better. If it takes one year to do make some clinical relevant changes with subcutaneous immunotherapy, it takes two years with sublingual. So they have done studies where they have given both the types of immunotherapy for two years and then stop and see what happens. All the symptoms come back in two years. Then they gave the same immunotherapy for three years and see what happens. And what happens after three years is about only 30 to 40 percent come back. 70 percent still continue to do well. So what it means is the minimum duration for immunotherapy, whether it's sublingual or subcutaneous, is three years. Minimum. So you have to take it for three years and probably most of us will give it for four years. Now, if you go ahead and stop immunotherapy for four years, how many people will do well? 70% will do well. How long will they do well? It can vary from five to 10 to 15 years. So the effect can last for quite some time, even after you stop the immunotherapy. Okay. So, a summary, subcutaneous is something we really would use it as a standard. Sublingual, the main advantage is it is almost risk-free, you know, very little risk. There is, there are certain systemic reactions also reported with sublingual, like people can break out with hives and all that, but nobody has died because of that. But sub subcutaneous, is definitely a little more risky but if you are using it in the proper recommended fashion taking all the precautions it's also quite very well accepted but you have to take it there is definitely risk of systemic reactions with uh, subcutaneous and if you look at the compliance between those two both methods have poor compliance both you will be amazed to see the compliance rate for allergen immunotherapy is only 20%. 80% of people stop the allergy injections or the drops. Why is this? The reason for that is not because they, it is not working, not because it is the wrong thing. The reason is lack of education. 
you know we go ahead you go ahead and tell them oh yeah tell them all these things about allergy injections and all that allergy drops they go home but in one week they have forgotten 75 percent of what you said so very very important for patients to be seen repeatedly they have done some studies in uh, taiwan and what it showed is more often you see them during immunotherapy complaints rate goes up so if you see them once in six months complaints rate is only 18 percent if you see them every three months complaints rate jumps up to 40 percent if you see them monthly complaints can come to 60 percent so what we generally tell our students is after you start the immunotherapy just don't cancel the patient and tell don't tell them okay i have started your immunotherapy starts and all that you start the drops we'll see you in six months see you next year don't do that have them come every month for the next six months every two months for the following six months and then every three to four months after another year and then every six months or once a year so very very important the follow-up if you are too busy have your assistant talk to them and go through this so somebody has to monitor these patients both for subcutaneous and sublingual immunotherapy right right sir um, <clears throat> sir has already told in his presentation about who would be a good candidate but let me ask from uh, pradeep pradeep what do you feel or who is a good candidate for immunotherapy or in a clinical practice whom yes. you consider that this patient is a candidate for immunotherapy yes sir so, already sir told uh, ig mediated diseases and t cell uh, uh, mediated diseases then the skin test positive and there should be a correlation between the clinical uh, testing and the skin test the patient right. is telling he is allergic to dust and your skin test is also showing uh, dust mite then uh, it is a, he is a very good candidate and if there is a discordance between the uh, test and the history then he is, may not be a good candidate then uh, failure to obtain relief with the normal pharmacotherapies that patients can be uh, good candidates then patients who are not willing for, for longer longer pharmacotherapies and uh, significant allergic uh, rhinitis patients with the asthma uh, asthma symptoms they are good candidates for uh, immunotherapy right so uh, a point to add over here is that uh, pharmacotherapy patient has been given the maximal pharmacotherapy and despite that the symptoms are not under control and we have good correlation with the allergen and the clinical history then probably they would be a right candidate yes. And uh, the pharmacotherapy needs to continue while the patient is on immunotherapy. And uh, only, I, I think, sir has put up in his presentation that when the patients, the, if the patient continues to take regular and the right immunotherapy, then you can actually decrease the pharmacological treatment, but that comes over a time. It should not be stopped as soon as possible. What's your say on that, sir? The pharmacotherapy fortunately is extremely effective but pharmacotherapy at the same time has huge limitations that is it will never stop the disease it is not going to stop the progression so the if you look at the mode of action of pharmacotherapy compared with the mode of action of immunotherapy immunotherapy is way superior because you are going to target where the problem is so it is not a good idea just because pharmacotherapy works for somebody that you don't want to consider immunotherapy. It is not going to, that is the way it is taught, but that is wrong. The thing is, if you feel that this patient has good correlation, okay, of skin testing and the history, and you feel that allergic factors are playing a major role here, and you feel there is a certain signs of progression, say like the patient start having lower airway symptoms. I think that's a, a indication for to discuss about allergen immunotherapy, even though the pharmacotherapy is working. And they have also looked at uh, what costs more over a period of time in the United States. Over a period of five years, allergen immunotherapy costs 60% less expense than the pharmacotherapy. 
because the pharmacotherapy keeps on increasing because of the progression patient has to use more and more and and with all the new drugs that are coming every time a new thing comes it's more expensive it does the same the same thing there are so many inhaled steroids I, to me all inhaled steroids are the same <laughs> you know you may say anything but they are all same it is like having the same blue shirt red shirt white shirt it's a shirt blue shirt is four times more expensive because the color looks something different but it does the same thing <laughs> same thing with cars or anything it's just a it is a big gimmick pharma companies do a big gimmick well, of changing you know like every time the car model comes the same engine but the 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 door looks different and you get all excited about it okay and that's the same thing here right. so, so <laughs> the same problem here is so very irrespective if you feel uh, this is a good candidate you should think about it another very important thing that you need to know is what we call the quality of life quality of life of an allergic patient is quite bad you know if so any of you know have allergies you know that every morning you get up you don't feel good you are tired because your sleep pattern is not good allergic people do not sleep well and allergic inflammation is maximal between 12 a.m and 4 a.m ir irrespective for all of them and the same inflammatory mediators that are infl that are occurring uh, that are involved in allergic conditions are the same mediators that are also with poor sleep irrespective poor sleep sleep is an inflammatory and poor sleep is an inflammatory condition okay so when you have this type of situation where the child is getting up in the morning he does not he hasn't slept he's grouchy his academic academic uh, performance is falling and he is sort of not in a good mood and this and that that is an indication you should do something more than pharmacotherapy because pharmacotherapy is not going to stop the mediator release it may just combat it but it is not going to stop anything okay so this is something you need to know and third one final thing is it is in the guidelines they have added that lingual immunotherapy in the guidelines but it is to me that is a wrong way of doing things because if the guidelines they have added when stage four when everything nothing has worked then add that is not the way to do it <coughs> at probably at level one not at level four so the guidelines are pro probably i don't follow guidelines i follow the patient so so this is something you need to be aware of the guidelines says level four that is a wrong thing that is in the guidelines so I think that is the difference between uh, uh, an outlook of a respiratory physician and a dedicated allergist, sir. Yes, sir. So <laughs> that is the reason. <laughs> right. Aditya, I come to you. Uh, do you feel, because you've been dealing with children as well, yes, is sir. immunotherapy safe for children? A very million dollar question people would like to Ma'am, actually, actually uh, these guidelines, they suggest that below two years, it is totally contraindicated. Mm -hmm. Three to five years, they have a relative contraindication and more than five years, it needs to be done. But as Sir was saying, with his experience, they are doing for less than three years also. So that, that changes the guidelines also. Correct. No, no, the guidelines I mentioned was at the level of treatment. If you look at the guidelines, it is level four where you are treated with uh, all the different medications like asthma and then the sublingual immunotherapy is added at level four of treatment regimen. I'm not talking yeah. about it. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, immunotherapy, because it is kind of a disease modifying modality, modality, what Sir is probably trying to ascertain is that it should be used more earlier as exactly. a preventive rather yeah, than exactly. the last exactly. stage where it has already Better candidates are the ones who are yeah. projecting earlier. Yes. <laughs> Try to treat early when the disease is early, when the patient is young, yeah. he's more responsive. And what the studies have shown, patch studies have shown, is you can prevent asthma from developing. You can actually reverse the asthma. You can slow down the remodeling. You can slow down the progression. What, which medication will do this? No other medication will do it. Right. No medication will do it. I'm not trying to only try to sell allergic chemotherapy. I am looking at it as 
looking at and comparing apple for apple. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, Utsav, uh, a question for you. How long does immunotherapy for yeah. allergies take to work and when can it be stopped confidently? Or it has to be taken lifelong? So uh, I think Vedantan sir has given an excellent answer, but this is something I think the we should repeat and repeat and repeat again for the benefit of the audience. So right. when we select a patient, choose a patient, do the SPT, everything is done. Then the allergy shots are given in two phases, basically. The build-up phase where injections are given in one to three times a week. And uh, this extends for three to six months. And then the maintenance phase that extends from, as sir said, from three to five years, you have to maintain, do give the maintenance doses for uh, once uh, for once a month. Sometimes you can do a rush immunotherapy thing, where multiple injections are given in same setting, uh, and uh, it will induce a faster uh, uh, induction of maintenance phase. So allergy symptoms don't stop overnight. Basically, allergy symptoms usually improve uh, by the beginning, by the end of first year. Most, most noticeable improvement happens during the second year. By the third year, the patient is uh, relatively very good uh, desensitized against the allergens contained in the shorts and no longer have any significant allergic reactions to these substances. After a few years, maybe three to five years, patients, uh, you know, they stop having any significant allergy problems even after the allergens are stopped. But some patients, some patients may at the even at the end of five years may require uh, ongoing shots to keep the symptoms down right so uh, i, really, uh, I agree there yes. one thing was uh, the clinical effect is uh, appreciable by the end of the year and definitely appreciable at the end of two years and three years you can actually start reducing medications yes, now, sir. As far as uh, any modality of treatment for any medical condition, you know, not all of us will respond the same way. We know that. Okay. Any, any medication, any, anything you take, because there is this genetic thing, which determines how you uh, respond. To the respond. So say, allergen immunotherapy is no, is a no exception. So there are some people who will not respond. <laughs> Correct. And there are some people when you stop the immunotherapy, everything comes back. So there are uh, there are people like that who will need it for 10, 15 years. I have several patients like that. And there are patients who will say, I would rather take the allergy injections a couple of times a year rather than keep on using these sprays and pills every day. Because allergy immunotherapy, the interval can be uh, interval between allergy injections can be increased to eight weeks between injection and still works. So every two months, he doesn't mind coming and getting an injection. So that is how the cl clinically relevant, um, I mean, uh, clinically speaking, so the response as well as the way people look at allergy immunotherapy varies from person to person, from doctor to doctor. But overall, I'm saying this is how the average thing will look. So there are always exceptions. There are always outliers. <clears throat> right, sir. So, but uh, it is little longer duration treatment and we should not consider it stopping at least before two years. Is uh, This is what I do in my practice. And say, an like, duration. <laughs> yeah, say like somebody is doing very well at the end of three years. I always think that we should give a trial of injections to everyone. Right. So what we do at the end of three years, or uh, sometimes even at the beginning of three years, we increase the interval between injections to three weeks for six months or one year. Then we go to four weeks. If somebody does well on once a month injections for two consecutive seasons, we say, you know, you are doing well. Now. Why don't we stop and see how it goes? And we stop the injections and as I mentioned before, after stopping injections, I have those slides slide later on, but I will just tell you by memory. The first year, maybe about two or three percent, or maybe less than five percent, will start having recurring symptoms. 
Second year, about 17 to 20 percent will start having symptoms. Third year, 30 percent will start having symptoms. But for after that, 70 percent will continue to do well. So patient will say, you know, you start. I don't. I can at the, at the end of third or fourth year. I don't know which which group he belongs to. I don't know he belongs to 30 percent or 70 percent. I don't know. So generally, we say, you know. This is something we have to try. If you are not happy or could be getting the symptoms, you are in the 30% group, you are getting symptoms. Yes, you come back. We will reevaluate and sort you back on it. If you are lucky and you are doing well on the 70% group, fine, you continue. But you still have to see me every year. Just because you do well, don't disappear. You see me at least once or twice a year. Because the allergy condition is something that can always recur. It can also be influenced by viral infections. Viral infections can break your immunity. Say like he gets a bad viral infection, he may start having symptoms again because viral infections and, and immunological uh, protection are closely related. So it can be undone by major uh, with viral infections. So there are quite a bit of uh, questions actually pouring in from the yes, audience. So I'll just try to take it them as well. So one is uh, in continuation that um, does allergy comes back after uh, stopping <coughs> immunotherapy, which sir has already uh, told. And if so, what is the recurrence rate? Roughly recurrence rate also sir has told. So I think we have answered that. Um, one question is coming is like uh, 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 um, just it's quite a bit of questions actually. What type of exams are best for those without respiratory symptom suitable for immunotherapy? Now that is something good question. Sorry, sir. I can't, I can't hear it. I I'm not audible. Uh, some audible. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. So uh, the which question, is the question, Dr. Richa? Go ahead. Can you repeat it? Yeah. What type of exams are best for detection of allergen? Are candidates with multiple allergens without respiratory symptoms a suitable candidate for immunotherapy? You know, when what what is the first portion? What is the best way to diagnose allergy? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The best way to diagnose allergy, there are three things. First history, second history, third history only. Yeah. History is the only way. It is not tests. Tests are complementary. The reason I tell you why. You are 14 of you right here. I will test all of you. I will find six of you being reactive. Okay. Then I will come and ask you, who has, anybody has history? Only two will have history. And maybe one will correlate. So why are these patients who are having no history having skin reactivity? Because we know that immunological sensitivity occurs way before clinical sensitivity. So you cannot depend upon skin testing to make a diagnosis. It is complementary. It adds on. So history is the only way for you to make a proper diagnosis. That is why we spend a lot of time taking an allergy history. Right, sir. And what is the second portion of it? Uh, 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 is the candidate with multiple allergens without respiratory symptoms um, suitable for? So, uh, someone who is showing allergies to multiple allergens on skin testing but has no respiratory symptom, is he a good candidate for immunotherapy? Okay. What he is trying to say is this is a sensitized patient has no symptoms. Yeah. You don't That's want right. to treat skin tests. I told you already. Yeah. You want to treat the patient. Patient has no complaint and you don't want to treat skin testing. But let me tell you one thing. There is a thing called early immunotherapy. It is called molecular immunotherapy. Molecular immunotherapy. It is now just at a research stage where immunological changes, we know, precede clinical changes. Now they go ahead and institute immunotherapy in these children and they have found Early immunotherapy seems to completely block the uh, advent of the clinical disease. So research-wise, logistic-wise, it seems to be a very uh, powerful way of handling it. You treat before 
the clinical symptoms come, you treat it at the immunological level. So that it may be may come down the road, but right now, the, as it stands in our practices, we cannot advise people to do that. But right. maybe ten years from now, we may have to, we may practice that way. Right. So um, there's a question from Andhra as well as Karnataka where they wanted to ask: Is immunotherapy a permanent cure, or is it curative for allergic rhinitis or asthma? So I've just combined both the questions. Generally, in medicine, we don't use permanent and we don't use the word cure. Both we can't use it. There's nothing permanent about anything. And there is nothing like a cure. Because cure means it will never occur. Permanent means it will never come back. And that will not happen. Because we know with all these things, we are dealing with human beings, human immune system, which is not an easy one very difficult it's a very tricky system so whenever you try to modulate the immune response it will help it will help to a certain extent but you cannot say or guarantee you know it will help you forever you will never come back there is always a chance it will come back it may not come back as bad as before so that will not happen right uh what's up uh since you have worked quite a bit uh sorry ravi want to uh, say something. I, I, ju I just wanted to give a break to PK sir and you ma'am uh, and I would also like to announce that uh, 912 people from all over India have logged in for this uh, immunotherapy oh. webinar. That's, that's but a lot of questions that's, that's, are coming in that is actually very interesting that people want to learn this and I think uh, Vedantan sir needs to record another session again because it, <laughs> it is actually very interesting to hear you uh, hear you talk sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. I thank thought you. I was talking to 14 people. <laughs> uh, no, no, sir. It's 914. <laughs> hey, uh, please, Ken. Yeah. Okay. What's up? Um, uh, I would ask you because you have quite a bit of experience in TB as well. Uh, what is the mechanism of flare of dormant TB with immunotherapy? And if it, how frequently it happens? Any thoughts about it? You know, actually, I don't have that much experience with TB. To be so, honest. Uh, yeah, but I was asking. Let's ask uh, Sir, sir then. Yes. Kumar and TB, the only thing I know is it can induce an energy. It can induce energy. That is, it will be less response or no response. Immune response is suppressed energy. But as far as the other things, I don't know. Yeah. I'll ask Utsav. Kumar, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is your experience? regarding the mechanism of flare of dormant TB with immunotherapy and how frequently it happens? No, ma'am, uh, uh, though uh, I have not, uh, not, not seen many patients of this uh, uh, flare up of dominant TB with uh, immunotherapy in our part of the country, uh, uh, this allergy practice is being done, but not, not uh, so I would rather recommend people who are trying to take up one should rule out uh, tuberculosis by a Montu test and a IGRA test and then go ahead for this kind of, a, uh, you know, allergy proposition, uh, this uh, initiation of allergy. But I personally speaking, I've not seen many patients of uh, this domain, in this domain, uh, having uh, TB flare up in a patient of latent tuberculosis, having an al allergy treatment on it. Okay, Ravi, Pradeep or Aditya, any uh, comments from your side on this in your clinical practice, if you would have seen? No, same two as two patients, two patients uh, incidentally who were on immunotherapy, uh, I happened to see them, they developed pleural effusion and both of them incidentally had a, a, had a history of childhood tuberculosis also. Okay. So I don't know the connection, but that is a definite observation I have seen. Uh, uh, Ravi sir, I wanted to ask, uh, did you uh, investigate uh, those uh, effusions to be tubercular again? Just wanted a query. No, uh, they, they were on a biochemical basis, definitely no pleural biopsy done because they had, basically they were taking treatment for asthma. So incidentally diagnosed pleural effusion, tapped out on the basis of ADA, it was diagnosed and treated and both of them recovered well. Treated for what? Treated for tuberculosis. On the basis of ADA, treated as tubercular pleural effusions for six months. Okay. Okay. Because it does not, uh, matlab, uh, uh, like, uh, again, does not, uh, don't, uh, I'm not pointing fingers here, but, uh, you know, just, just a question that 
uh, why would uh, a patient having a treatment of subduing his allergy would flare up his tuberculosis that does not fit the pattern just a question i do agree i do agree but since the point came up i just shared this experience okay you know, um i i think see uh, what is happening is it is all a game of t lymphocytes right th1 yeah. is tb tb is mediated by th1 and allergy is by th2 so when we trying to give immune modulation when we are trying to change the path right to th you know a uh, mechanism uh, would be uh, some flare up of tbs if it is happening um uh, ma'am have you uh, uh, experienced a case like this before have you experienced yourself a no, case so like this no we haven't in fact at cmc we are not doing immunotherapy very frequently i would say it was dr um, pkv's initiative and we started doing some but there is always a problem of procuring the right uh, you know drugs so that is why we are not very much into the immunotherapy at present um okay so uh, somebody has asked how long do we need to continue antihistamines after giving allergen immunotherapy as long as the patient needs it yeah that's a simple one <laughs> um, um i would like to ask question yes yeah, <laughs> vidantan sir uh, as ma'am was talking that they are not able to procure those quality antigens how can you get to know that the antigens which you are using for the patient are quality antigens and what to compare with yeah it's a good question actually this is a difficult question also <laughs> okay but i know certain suppliers who get imported antigens in india there are three important antigens luckily for us in india we don't have that much of polysensitization people get sensitized to maybe three four major ones that are those are dust mite cockroach alternaria but fortunately if you are sensitized to several pollens the indian antigens are quite good for pollens okay Okay. so i am talking about three major antigens which need to be imported one is dust mite another one is cockroach another one is alternaria these because these are the three antigens which actually are asthmogenic that means it causes asthma so do not take chances with it make sure you are using good quality antigens for these three 82% of people who have allergies in india are sensitized to dust mite correct okay now if you want to look at cockroach do you want to use immunotherapy for cockroach my answer is no you don't have to use immunotherapy because pest control has been shown to really take care of it it can reduce and also there are studies to show as you reduce the cockroach antigen content the conditions get better the asthma gets better the sensitization gets better and mold another the alternaria is a mold where immunotherapy is not as effective as it is for pollen and dust mite okay it is good but it is not so generally you are finally it comes down to one antigen dust mite correct the major ones you would try to get good one dust mite because you know 82% of your patients are sensitized to that so use one good stuff and one good stuff will make a big difference in your patients because dust mite is been shown to be the major one not only for india for several asian countries in temperate climates and uh, that is all we are talking about so if it comes out to be in mold uh, do you recommend giving immunotherapy or you also recommend giving antifungals also no we do not use antifungal we generally try to do environmental control for dust mite uh, for the mold yes. mold why does mold occur mold occurs in the house you see it's very common it is quite common if you look if you go to any of the in the homes in india and you just what you have to do is to just look at the roof that's all just keep on looking at the roof and look at the corners 
and you will see some paint peeling a discoloration so that is quite common so that means there's water leak there is leak so mold needs leakage some moisture and warmth and both of it are there now mold is a type of uh, issue that moldy environment can you know that be in pulmonology that it will flare up any uh, the lung problem irrespective of allergy you don't have to be allergic to molds mold by itself is pathogenic for lungs it will cause problems okay so mold control is one of the basic things whenever there is any you know try to take care of the leak and there are certain things that are also used to lysol and all that they spray but unless you make sure the leak is gone it will not work even immunotherapy will not work as long as there is mold growth because mold is a very difficult thing and there are actually if you look at how much knowledge we have about molds is very little there are about 6000 types of molds and we are we know only around 20 or 30 of them okay so our knowledge about mold is very minimal whereas our knowledge about dust mite and all that is pretty significant uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, is there any preference between FADIOTOP and the skin test? FADIOTOP, the immunocap yes. test, I believe they are talking about. Oh, both, the are skin good tests. Tests. both are good. Both are good tests. Both are good correlation. Okay. The okay. problem is with skin testing is more natural. That means with skin testing, what you are trying to do, it's a bioassay in vivo. You know, bioassay in vivo where you are looking at the bound IgE when you do skin testing you prick the skin test the antigen enters through that uh, that uh, small opening goes into the dermis and you have the mast cell sitting right there with the IgE hooked onto it and that is what also happens in nature when you have an allergic inflammation that is bound IgE is what is affected so it is more relevant to what happens in, in nature with FADIOTOP or immunocap whatever you are looking at the free circulating IgE. Nothing wrong in it, but that is not what naturally it happens. Okay. And looking at the cost factor, it is definitely several times more expensive to do immunocap compared to skin test. Maybe, I don't know, 20 times, 30 times more. Now, if you look at the, what does the family feel? If I do a skin test, and I get a wheel reaction, wheel and flare reaction within 15 minutes. I know that is exactly what's happening in your respiratory tract. Exactly same thing. It is a wound. It is occurring all the way from the nose down into the lungs. It's a wound. And when then that's what remodeling is. It's like our roads. You know, you get all these ruts and all the holes and then you put more uh, tar and again there's rut and then there's all this. It's like Indian road. That is what the mucous membrane of the allergic uh, pers person looks like. It's remodeled. It's a wound. So I can tell the mother, you see, this is what's happening in your child's lung or child's nose. This is exactly what's happening. What is happening in the skin test is what's happening in your nose. It's an indirect way. Skin is used as an indirect evidence of what's going on in your respiratory tract. Okay. And with immunotherapy, this reduces the swelling. Actually, it has been shown that this reduces the reduction of skin testing uh, reaction happens both for late phase and early phase with skin test. It happens. So I would definitely go for skin test in selective patients, in extremes of age, in patients who have got extensive eczema where you cannot do skin tests or patients who have come from long ways and they have forgotten to stop antihistamines and there is no other way, then I would do selective immunocap. But skin test is the best way to go. Sure. Uh, so there's one uh, actually very clinical relevant question uh, coming from Delhi. A patient who has improved on immunotherapy and is symptom free for a decade or so. What if a person who started on immunotherapy for three to four years in her 30s now has recurrence of symptoms in her 50s? Is she a good candidate for restarting the immunotherapy? Therapy. Okay, so this patient had immunotherapy when she was in the 30s and in the 50s she is having recurrent symptoms and that is exactly the reason why we mentioned before there is nothing like a permanent and there is nothing like a cure. So this we do see, okay, 
and then you just treat them like any other patient. You again go ahead and take the history and go ahead and do the evaluation, do the skin testing and it will be interesting to see, compare the skin test results at 50 compare with the, what happened at 35 and see what is the similarity. You still have to do the correlation okay? because allergens and allergic allergens can change. You can get sensitized to newer ones okay? or the ones that you have been sensitized before can come back and maybe it is more exaggerated now. So she, you treat like any other new patient. Right. So are there any incidences of um, anaphylaxis in patients uh, undergoing immunotherapy? Anybody has any experience on that? Or what does literature say about incidence of anaphylaxis in patients who are undergoing immunotherapy? I have had several of them. So what happens is uh, when you come out of fellowship, you want to do the ideal stuff. You want to go very high dosage and all that. That's what I did. In the first six months of my practice, I had six anaphylaxis. Okay. Then I come to know that you can't treat, you can't do what is like an ivory tower practice. You, you see, being in a big research institute and being in the outside in a regular um, a grassroots level is different. So we had to make some adjustment. So what we needed to do, what we need to do is certain precautions with subcutaneous immunotherapy, the anaphylaxis is more common. You want to make sure when you are giving allergic injections, the patient's asthma is under full control, very important. If you look at the deaths due to anaphylaxis, 75% of the deaths that have occurred due to anaphylaxis during for allergen immunotherapy occurred in patients who had unstable asthma, who had brittle asthma, whose asthma was not under good control. So what we do is whenever patients come for allergy injections to our office, we always ask them two questions. One, how are you doing? How many times did you use your pump test last night? Okay, then let's have you blow in the peak flow. We, we would not give allergy injections if their peak flow is less than in 75-80% of their best. Okay. And if they qualify for it, then we give the allergy injections. Okay. So it's very important and have them wait for 30 minutes. All because it is not 20 minutes is not enough. About 28% of systemic reactions occur after 30 minutes also, after they have left the office. So we always have them carry a peep pen, all of them have to carry a pen with them. So these are the precautions you have to take. Now sublingual what do you do? Sublingual also have, can cause systemic reactions. You also have to make sure their asthma is stable before you give sublingual. Don't, don't, don't put the drop in the child's mouth when he is wheezing. Okay. So you have to look for it and you also have to have a pen even for sublingual ready at home. Because medical legally, it can be an issue if you just say, oh, it is perfectly safe. But there are so many instances of sublingual can also cause reactions. So you have to have EpiPen available in these patients. And sublingual patients cannot just take the drop and disappear. They have to stay in front of you for at least 20 minutes. Right. So a very valid question again. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to inputs from all the panelists who have been practicing this allergies and immunotherapies or for that matter in testing as well. Um, how to know whether the allergen extract are of good quality, one, and what is the best commercially available allergen extract in India? So how do we know which is the, how, how do we know whether the allergen extracts are of good quality, okay. number one. And number two, what is which are the best commercially available allergen extracts in India? You know, can I answer that or what? Yes, Vedantan sir will answer that. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> yes, sir, please answer, sir. Uh, if you want to know, you, you looking at the label, you first look at the label. The label will say the name of the extract. It will also tell the batch number. It will tell you what we call as potency. Potency. 
Now, for potency, there are two units, two types of units are used. One is AU, allergy units, or BAU, biological allergy units. <coughs> These are the only two units. There are other units that are other units that are used that has nothing to do with potency, with they say weight per volume, P and use, they are all used, they have nothing to do with potency. So first look at whether it says 100,000 uh, BAU or AU. And if it says that, that is actually, if it says that those are actually standardized antigens. Okay. Now, what is standardization? Is standardization is only a measure of potency. What standardization is, is a measure of consistency. That means each batch is consistent with each other. So if I have an antibiotic which is 500 milligram in this batch, next batch will also be 500 milligrams. Okay. And that is what standardization is. So in the United States, we have 75 antigens. Out of that, only 19 are standardized. 56 are not standardized. Does it mean non-standardized antigens are bad? Not really. They are all quite still potent. They are not consistent from batch to batch. Okay. Now coming back to know whether it is good or not is say like you have a, a clinically you are sus you are really convinced you know this patient really looks like he's sensitized to dust my the way i get the clinically i get a feeling he's having all these symptoms early morning and all this type of stuff the seasonal variation and the skin test is totally negative okay then you start wondering you know why is there they are not correlating at all a strong history is not correlating then you try to you are questioning the quality of the antigen okay and that is one of the ways that that's one of the things that makes you suspicious about the antigen it doesn't correlate at all not once it is not correlating may several times it is happening it is not correlating okay now it is not ethical for me to mention names of companies here uh, in a public forum like this so i would say in the indian companies indigenous companies are quite good in producing good pollen extracts good pollen extracts okay mold i'm not very sure just my so so you know some are okay some are okay so i am a little bit hesitant there because of i'm also based upon the study we did at the cmc which shows that it is of poor quality so i have to say dust mite is of poor quality generally so that is where it stands pollens are good moles are so so dust mite is not good and we do not have proper antigens for insect venoms it's not available okay or for uh, uh, another thing that we test a lot is uh, drug allergy. That's a totally a different ball game. We can talk about it later some other time. So for uh, regular inhalants, pollens are fine. So sir, how do you get those antigens tests which you are using? Like you get to know that dust mite is not very good. So how do you get to check that? Kaha testing ke liye ho isko, sir? I can give you the source where it's available. Okay. I can give it to Dr. Richa. Pardon? The testing facility, right? Yeah, no, it is actually a guy who can, you see these, there are certain people who can import these antigens. Okay. Okay, just like you are importing so many different drugs and all that, these are people who are dealing with these type of things. But the quality of antigens that you are using, you get to know over the course of the immunotherapy you give to the patient. That is it? Yes, yes, yes. 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 You, we always use good quality antigens. We do not use... No, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that like I'm giving a patient immunotherapy. So during the course of time when the patient is not feeling better after some time of giving immunotherapy, when he should be feeling better. So you get to know that the quality you of it. Yeah, you get a little suspicious, you get a little bit, you know, it is something idea. vague, but you can get a sort of a feeling, you know, it's not really okay. making any difference. You know, then you start questioning, you know, is this something I need to be concerned? I need to check it out. Yes. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So, but if you want to be very, very scientific, you can send it to a lab and they can do an assay. Of so the, that what lab I'm asking, like what yeah, lab can, they can do, what you they can do, like what is, what does this extract has in it? Okay. They can do an assay of what is the allergenic content of this particular preparation. They can tell you it has got so much of so much, so much. Right. 
Great. So um, I think we have quite a bit of uh, discussion and a very healthy discussion. One last question probably I would take because we are running out of time. Um, uh, so if we take allergens from abroad, are they relevant in India pertaining to Indian species is what the question is. And if we talk about the procuring immunotherapy, uh, these agents for immunotherapy, uh, the allergens from, for immunotherapy from abroad, uh, are there any legal issues with that, sir? Or... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> allergens know. from abroad, has, has it, uh, sir, uh, Vedantan, sir, do you try it? Well, have you given it a trial before? Like importing allergens and then using them in Indian settings? No, this is what I would say. For whether they are relevant or not, generally, you don't want to import pollen stuff from somewhere. Because pollens, especially the among pollens, trees are the ones that change from area to area. You want to stick to the local ones. You need, to yes, respect, you need to respect the aerobiological work that has been done in India extensively. Very good aerobiological data we have. So when we have that type of data, we should not think about getting extracts for pollen from somewhere else. I am only talking about one thing, dust mite. Okay. That might, the reason why that is not because any of the manufacturers are really messing up anything. You see, it's a difficult one to manufacture. It's a culture. So when you culture the dust mite, okay, it will grow. The dust mite will grow. There's no problem in it. But once you are storing it, there is always a contamination with some mold will be there. And there is what we call as proteases in these molds. Proteases are proteolytic enzymes. Okay. And dust mite is a low protease. Mold is a high protease. When you have a mold as a contaminant, it eats up the dust mite. Okay, it eats it up. It is di it disintegrates the dust mite antigen. So by the time you get it there for testing, there is not much dust mite left there. So it is more of a technical problem to make sure there is no mold contamination. Okay. So it is not like Indian next they don't know how to do the dust mite. I am not saying that, but con there is some contamination. There could be some contamination, the mold that could be causing this problem. Okay, because I don't want somebody to jump on me tomorrow, some pharmaceutical company. Because we respect them. We deal with them. Nobody would dare to do that, sir. And I don't want huh? <laughs> nobody would dare to do that, sir. No, no, you can't say anybody can do anything nowadays, you know, I democratic mean, country and nothing like, you know, so in a public farm, you have to be, you can't point fingers at anyone. Right. You can point fingers at yourself, but not at anyone. So, uh, uh, last two questions and very quick one, uh, probably 30 seconds each. Uh, any role of immunotherapy in food allergy? One and role of biologicals in um, this thing, allergic rhinitis or, yeah, allergic right. disease. You allergic know, rhinitis, when allergic I did my fellowship, allergic. when I did my fellowship or even when I was in practice and all that type of stuff, we always said no immunotherapy for food allergies. But now it has changed. We do have immunotherapy, oral immunotherapy, but there are some limitations. There's a huge difference between the immunotherapy for inhalants like dust mite and pollens and in immunotherapy for foods. Only officially speaking, there's only one immunotherapy preparation available right now, which is accepted by the FDA, which is for peanuts. What is it meant for? It is only meant for to protect against accidental ingestion of peanuts. Accidental. So it is not going to protect against whole, you can't eat the whole bag full of peanuts. It will still have reaction. It will only prevent reaction up to three peanuts, you know, three peanuts. Okay. So what happens is each peanut has 300 milligrams of the protein content. So it will protect you against 900 milligrams. Nobody will eat three peanuts for accidental. Okay, accidental ingestion is say like the child goes to some party and all that and grabs a, a, a candy and grabs and eats it. There's a small piece of peanut in it and the, he will be protected against that. 
previously that much of propene that would cause a huge reaction anaphylactic reaction so that type of protection is there with oral immunotherapy but you cannot do oral immunotherapy loosely it is it has its own major issues if you give too much it will have major systemic reactions so you have to follow all the instructions and you have to make sure the family understands the limitations okay and it is an important thing that not every allergist can do it. It is done usually at a center where there are uh, precautions to be taken. If there's a major reaction, the child has to be treated right away. So you can't just do it in a setup where they are seeing a lot of patients and they don't have time to handle such reactions. So it has limited. So, but oral immunotherapy for food is available now only for one food, palforzoria is the trade name and it works very well. And uh, for accidental ingestion, it may look like simple thing, but I have seen people who are families where there is peanut allergy the whole family's dynamics has changed one child having peanut allergy the whole family dynamic has changed you know i got a call call from a cardiologist the other day this is two years ago he said pk i am worried about my daughter i said worry why are you worried you know she has joined this medical college but i don't know she's allergic to peanuts i worry about it a lot because she could eat one peanut in some party and get a terrible reaction. She still carries an epithel. See, the reason I am saying is just one food allergy can mess up a lot of things. You are worried about a 25 year old having small going to a party and eating one peanut and getting into trouble. This is the dad who is worried. So I just want you to understand the dynamics of this situation. So yeah. that type of problem is solved by this oral immunotherapy. Right. right. Uh, since the, we, are, we have actually overshoot the time, I would take this opportunity to thank Dr. PKV for being so instrumental in making this allergy mm -hmm. webinar so lively. I would also like to thank Young Brigade of Dynamic Young uh, Pulmonologist and Budding Allergist who have participated actively in this webinar. And I hope we tried to answer quite a bit of uh, queries which audience has posed, but a few of them I tried to answer. Since the time is limited, we are closing. And uh, maybe if there are something very burning points, it can be given to the uh, CCI and they can forward it to Dr. PKV and sir can answer them and we can post them back, something like that. I don't know if it is- That's possible. okay, we can do that. You can meet me by email. I will take a little time to, you know, because I'm quite busy in the next week. You know, the number of questions we have got in this uh, this uh, webinar it's, uh, itself, uh, you know, it shows that people who have joined are actually very much interested to take this practice forward. Uh, it is possibly a, one of the most remarkable practice changing presentations I've been a part of, sir. So I congratulate Richa, ma'am, and Vedantan, sir. And Doshi sir and Pradeep, me and Cha, uh, Aditya, both of all of us actually. So I find this a very, very yeah. uh, interesting presentation. Very eye One take home message. One take home message for everybody who is starting immunotherapies for the patients and starting this practice of immunotherapy from Dr. Vedantan. Get the dust mite antigen imported because <laughs> that is not getting made in India with a quality one. So if you want to give a quality thing to the patient, for your immunotherapy practice, so you should get a dust mite imported from outside. Correct, sir? Yes. Okay. Yes. So thank you so much, everyone, uh, for participating in this webinar. Thank you, CCI, for making it possible. Um, uh, we just close with this. And thank you, everyone, and good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. I think uh, you are the most one of the most motivated groups <laughs> and it is always a fun to talk to someone who wants to learn. It is always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you. Thank Good you. Sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Good Cheers, night. everyone. Good night.